All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning for you anyways. Um, I'm really pleased to be joining you this morning all the way from Canada and more specifically Treaty 1 territory in the homeland of the Métis Nation. Today, I'm really excited to be sharing some findings from a new survey with you. Um, we at the Canadian Centre for Child Protection are actually still running this survey, but I'll be sharing with you some initial findings and the basis of a report that's soon to be published on our website. And what it does is delves into the experiences of caregivers of child sexual abuse material survivors, and most importantly, um, some policy recommendations from them and us as well. We go to the next slide. Just to make sure we're all on the same page to begin with, child sexual abuse material or CSAM, that refers to any image, video, or other kind of recording of a minor or child being sexually abused or exploited. So this can include, for example, um, a child being instructed uh, to pose in a very extremely sexual way while naked. Um, you might be more familiar with the legal counterpart, which is child pornography, but that phrase has really fallen out of favor, particularly in survivor-led spaces, um, for a couple of reasons, but I mean, it <laughs> fails to convey the fact that child sexual abuse material isn't some kind of consensually produced cinematic feat, um, but rather it is abuse and it is harmful. So, for example, on the next, if you go ahead, um, in our 2017 survey, survivors told us how every single time an offender views and circulates the imagery of their abuse, they're re-victimized, right? Their abuse is memorialized, and unfortunately, it's not just that it's, you know, taken and then stored on the offender's private device. Um, only it's often circulated widely online by very large networks of offenders, um, often proliferating, right? It's shared and reshared and shared, and that trauma continues um, in terms of that it being viewed. But in addition, there's very real possibilities that the more offenders see this, the more offenders might be a uh, able to track down survivors, stalk them, dox them, harass them, even further abuse them. Um, and these aren't just hypotheticals. These things happen. These fears have materialized for a number of the survivors who've shared their stories with us. Um, go to the next slide. Survivors also told us that it wasn't just them who's impacted by the child sexual abuse material. Also their caregivers and their entire families are impacted by offenders' crimes too. Um, and surveying the experiences of their caregivers can give us some really unique insight into the challenges that these families faced, the ways in which it impacted them, um, and different ideas as how to strengthen policy and support so that these folks are best supported and taken care of. But as there's relatively little research on the experiences of non-offending caregivers of CSAM survivors, that's what we uh, sought to do with the survey I'll tell you about today. On the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about the method. Um, here we are looking at the experiences of 20 non-offending caregivers of CSAM survivors, so meaning they are not caregivers who participated in um, the creation of the child sexual abuse material. Most were women, parents, and from Canada. To develop the survey, which was anonymous and online, we worked in close consultation with a number of wonderful experts worldwide, um, and most importantly, six mothers of CSAM survivors. In the end, we had 126 questions about the abuse and its aftermath. Most of them were open-ended, um, meaning that participants could write in or type in their own thoughts um, and really describe their perspective to us. We worked to take a trauma-informed approach throughout. Um, we did that in a few different ways, but just to give you one example on the next slide, um, this is a screenshot of one of the um, sections. So at 
the survey was organized into thematic sections. And at the start of each section, we did um, two things. We added in an opportunity to um, allow or facilitate participants taking a break with a calming image like this one. And then we gave them an opportunity to exercise autonomy and choice. So they got a little description about the content that was coming up, how many questions were in that section, and then they could choose. Did they want to continue with this section or did they want to skip ahead to the next section for whatever reason? As you see, this is an online survey. So we recruited for the survey in a few different ways. Uh, through our social media, through many wonderful partner organizations around the world, um, and then also just through the folks who we connect with at the Canadian Centre for Child Protection, who we know are parents and caregivers to child sexual abuse material survivors. So on the next slide, to analyze the survey data, we used inductive thematic analysis um, with that doesn't mean we didn't go in with really um, predefined hypotheses or with a particular th um, theoretical framework, but rather we read through the data, we sat with it, we coded it, we discussed it as a group, and then it was this iterative process back and forth between coding the data and discussion. And ultimately, we landed on four main themes. So I'll share a few of those with you today. On the next slide, we have the first theme, which is that offenders' crimes of sexually abusing children and recording the abuse drastically impacted survivors' caregivers. So every single survivor's parent who or caregiver rather, who completed the survey described having adverse physical, emotional, and psychological effects. Um, one mom told us that it's caused lifelong health problems, high blood pressure, aneurysms, depression, anxiety. It ruined our lives. So these were all pretty common. Um, perhaps most common though were mentions of post-traumatic stress disorder. On the next slide, and they also talked about social impact, um, in particular, the loss of relationships. So this mom's quote, encapsulates those really well. She said, I have no friends. I alienated myself from people so I don't have to give explanations. Friends that I had before the issue came to light treated us like we had the plague after because the abuse was all over the news. I like this quote because it illustrates uh, the loss of relationships on, you can think of both ends. So this mom's talking about how she's pulling back from others that was very common amongst caregivers. Many talked about um, specifically their sense of trust just being completely shattered in not just the person who had been the abuser, but all people. And then we also heard a lot about other people pulling away, whether that be family members, friends, um, community members due to stigma and victim blaming. Now, in addition to impacting survivors' caregivers, on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about how the crimes also negatively impacted the whole family. So again, as I'm sure you can imagine, the loss of relationships was not just limited to caregivers. Um, very sadly, a lot of them talked about how other parents in the neighborhood, once they'd found out what had happened, they wouldn't let their children play anymore with um, the survivor child or the survivor child siblings. Caregivers also talked about changes in their parenting after they found out about the abuse and its recording. Um, Hypervigilance was really common. One parent said, I overprotected to the point that my kids felt like I had a stranglehold on them. I didn't trust anyone new who came into our lives. I was afraid to let them go to sleepovers, and then when I did, I became an amateur private eye, including paying for background checks on anyone that they were around. So we saw a lot of hypervigilance. Caregivers also told us about, uh, just um, on a broader level, I suppose, just no longer trusting their ability to parent at all. So often oscillating between this hypervigilance as well as permissiveness. Next slide, please. 
So families were now met with a whole bunch of other responsibilities that they ha didn't have before, just specific to the crimes. So for instance, now having to go to therapy appointments, find an appropriate therapist, uh, work through the legal system, interviews with uh, police or other sorts of law enforcement bodies, trying to find the abuse material online, and as we'll talk about later, often unsuccessfully requesting it be taken down. Um, there are very many other impacts, but the last one that I'll highlight was financial hardship. This was a big one. Um, many caregivers lost income. They maybe had to retire early or just uh, stop working otherwise for a time because of the way that they were physically and psychologically impacted by the abuse. Um, others, like this parent, talks about um, that in some different ways. So she said, I had to make choices with my career that would be best for the children. I couldn't take on a job that required too much of my time because they needed me, which left the opportunity for advancement in a position unrealistic, which also limited my income potential. It was quite common for folks to be saying that they um, missed wages because of all these different appointments um, or just like the time they spent navigating these systems, um, losing out on then in turn these opportunities for advancement. Um, other ways in which they were impacted financially was not just limited to wages by any means. The legal court battles were often quite hefty in terms of the financial impact. Um, some people had to move um, for a variety of reasons, but sometimes for safety reasons to try and get away from the offender or because of the incredible social stigma that was happening in the community and trying to give the family a fresh start. Um, and just to give you a sense of the significance of the financial hardship, there were a few caregivers who let us know that it had been so significant that they actually lost their home. So on the next slide, um, we see that unfortunately, as families were trying to navigate systems um, that are intended to help them, they were continually met with inadequate and re-traumatizing responses instead. Um, and most importantly, sometimes these system failures meant that the children continued to be abused. The first system we'll touch on briefly is the public health system, uh, specifically the lack of fully subsidized, ongoing, and specialized therapy. These barriers um, meant that many families were not able to get the therapy that they told us that they had wanted and needed and most certainly deserved. So one parent here says, um, well, to back up a step, uh, the fact that we'll just focus on fully subsidized or the lack of fully subsidized funding for a minute. Um, there were some families who weren't able to access any therapy at all for anyone because of the incredible financial barrier. And then in other families, maybe only um, the survivor or just one of the survivor children in a couple circumstances were able to get funding, but others in the family needed it too. So here a dad told us that they gave my son whose imagery was recorded, they gave him counseling and nothing for me or my older boy who saw the video of the abuse. And he needed help to deal with that. And I needed help or counseling to get through the emotional and mental stress. We're still pretty messed up and unstable. We're doing the best that we can with all we've been put through. So certainly the lack of fully subsidized therapy was a barrier for many to uh, access therapy. Other barriers included it not being for long enough or at the particular life stages where they might have needed it most. And even when people were able to access um, therapy, it was really difficult for them to find specialized therapy. Someone who wasn't just an expert in trauma, but in child sexual abuse material specifically, and understood that it was more than just a photo. Uh, 
Now on this next slide, we have Child Protective Services responses. And it was a really unfortunate irony that in several cases, Child Protective Services actually failed to protect children. Um, so in one, well, in a couple cases, the abuse was actually still happening because one caregiver who was completing our survey knew that another caregiver of the child of the child or children was abusing them and had created abuse material and yet for a variety of reasons including failures of child protective services those children continued to be abused at the time that the caregivers were completing our survey um, in other cases caregivers talked about how the abuse had ended but it could have ended sooner um, had Child Protective Services acted differently. So one mom told us how she'd called Child Protective Services to their home because I saw a picture that I thought was inappropriate of my daughter on the diaper, diaper changing table. And I hadn't known until that point that my husband had had a camera to be able to take a picture of it and then put it on the computer. Child Protective Services dropped the ball by never checking the computer. That could have spared my daughter three years of unknown abuse. Child Protective Services um, did other things. Participants told us how, you know, maybe they had called in concerned and then <laughs> Child Protective Services uh, did not investigate the other caregiver, but in then instead treated them as the person of suspicion. Um, and yeah, just uh, se several other inadequate and re-traumatizing responses. So next we'll talk about the criminal justice system. Um, they had very similar responses on the next slide. Um, but one additional one I'll highlight what is the practice of showing abuse imagery to caregivers. So this is something that sometimes happens in the context of, um, of a law enforcement or um, investigation. And it is typically said to be done with the purpose of identification. Uh, so they show the caregivers the abuse imagery to either identify their own child, another potential victim, the offender or offenders, maybe the location, um, but the experts, so both uh, academics, people who work in this field, and importantly survivors, will tell us that this isn't necessary. Um, there are always other things you can do to be able to identify um, those people or locations. And most importantly, that that can be done in, in, instead of re-traumatizing the family, right? So um, every single person who had had this experience described it as incredibly scarring and traumatic. Um, one parent said, it was a horrific experience and it made me feel, I can't even describe it. The first image that they showed me is inscribed in my brain and I will never forget it. Most of the others are locked away in my head as I try to block out what I saw for my sanity. On the next slide, uh, we have the fourth uh, system, I suppose, it, that met families with inadequate and re-traumatizing responses when they went to them for help, and that's the technology companies. Um, so there, there were several. Um, issues, but one I wanted to highlight were barriers to removing CSAM. So family members uh, or their caregivers would find the child sexual abuse material online. They would reach out to these companies and for a variety of reasons, um, the companies wouldn't take it down, even though this is illegal and abusive imagery. So one way that that looked like, and one set of barriers was the caregiver here reached out and then she was told she would need to give a bunch of personal and most importantly identifying information. Um, so 
A, that's a concern because that just heightens the possibility that some offender or other bad actor might be able then to link the personal information to the child sexual abuse material and, as I mentioned before, then facilitate the further abuse of the child. Um, but <laughs> one thing I want to make really clear here is the fact that when child sexual abuse material exists on some platform or website, um, what that means is that someone was able to put it there, right? An offender was able to upload it and or share it on a platform, but then when these family members reach out saying, that's my child, that's a minor, take it down, that's illegal, their companies are putting up more barriers to have this illegal harmful material removed than they had put up to have or than they had had for it to be put up online in the first place. Next slide, please. So I've talked about a lot of really negative things that these caregivers and their families were met with, right? The impacts on them individually, on their entire family, and then on a broader level or on a systemic level, these barriers that they um, were met with when they were trying to get help and protect their children. Despite all of that, though, the families were remarkably persistent and resilient. We saw a lot of examples of healing um, in relationships, for instance, um, and not just the caregivers themselves, but also their whole family. So here, um, this was a caregiver who said the other kids, so meaning her children who were not survivors, they found it stressful and we had to work hard to make life normal for them while we were dealing with this crisis. But now I feel we're closer. We communicate about difficult issues and we make sure to spend time doing things together. This was part of our therapy. We as parents are more watchful and maybe less trusting, but we try to balance it so that we're not giving a message of fear. So um, the Caregivers in the survey, many of them when talking about their healing, also pointed to advocacy as being a pivotal um, part of that. And that's what every caregiver who participated in this survey did. They shared their experience in ways that can help us to strengthen policy. So on the next slide, I'll just quickly go over uh, the policy recommendations. These are much more detailed in the report. Um, but they're targeted at those systemic failures. So we'd like to see public health approaches that provide ongoing specialized therapy to not only survivors, but also their siblings, as well as their caregivers at no cost. For child protective services and criminal justice systems, we'd like to see mandated trauma-informed training and practices, and in particular, ending the unnecessary and traumatizing uh, practice of showing families the abuse material. And finally, for tech companies, we'd love to see the creation of regulatory frameworks that ensure that they're doing their part to curtail these cycles of abuse. So on the next slide here, actually you can skip that one I think for time and just end on the next slide. So thank you so much for listening and I look forward to hearing your questions.